plenty of us have boxes of loose family photos stored away somewhere that aren't getting much attention or use. So if that's you, you're not the only one, but you might be the only one who has those exact photos. They're one of a kind historical artifacts, and that means that it's up to you to make sure those photos withstand the test of time and that they're preserved and accessible for future generations. Otherwise, they might be damaged, destroyed, forgotten, or lost, and can never be recovered. Photographs are susceptible to damage and degradation over time, whether that's from light, water damage, natural disasters, it could even be exposure to certain chemicals like an adhesive in a photo book or a Sharpie pen. Digitizing and backing up your family's photo collection can prevent that and will make it easier to not only preserve them, but to share them as well. It does not have to be a complicated task that you dread. Don't put off digitizing your photos because it seems overwhelming and you don't have the time to do that right now or take on that kind of a project. All you have to do is dedicate a small amount of time each day or each week to digitizing and you'll make headway even if it's slowly but surely. Once you get a system going, the process will be easier. So decide what's manageable for you and then stick with it. First, you need to gather all of your materials together. That includes your photos, your tools, and whatever equipment you'll be using. Once you've gathered your photos, take stock of what you have. You can identify a good starting point based on the preservation needs of your photographs. So any photos that are especially old and delicate, maybe some photos that you noticed are already starting to fade from exposure or have otherwise been degraded due to their use and storage, that's where you wanna begin. Start digitizing these photos first. Depending on the types of photos that you have in your collection, you might want to have some tools at your disposal as well. I'm a librarian and when we were digitizing historical Carlsbad photographs at the library a few years ago, we had a toolkit for handling the photos during the scanning process. It had a pair of white gloves to prevent the oils from your fingers leaving any prints on the photos or the negatives and the slides. It had a bulb blower for removing dust and dirt from the glass in the photos, as well as a microfiber cloth to clean any smudges on the glass of the scanner bed. It also had a small plastic spatula for lifting the photographs from the scanner bed without bending or damaging the edges, and it also had a ruler so that we could measure the photos. These tools are meant to safeguard your photos during the scanning process and ensure that you're getting a clean image. So I'll leave the links down in the description for each item if you'll be needing any of those for your project. The second step is deciding how you want to digitize your photos. Two important factors to think about are the resolution and the file type of the digital files that you'll be creating from your photos. Generally, you'll want your digital master to be high quality. And when I say digital master, what I mean is the digital file that will be preserved as the original for the purpose of archival storage. Think of the digital master like a photographic negative. You use a negative to make reproductions of the photograph, but you never alter the negative itself. So if you ever wanna edit one of your photos, you can make copies of the digital master to enhance or alter the photo, maybe crop it or colorize it, but you never alter the digital master, only the copies that you make of it. Deciding on what resolution and file type you want will depend on what your priorities are and the time and effort that you're willing to put into this project. Are you going to want a high quality image that you can use to blow up and make large prints of? Or are you more concerned with digitizing as quickly and easily as possible? Maybe your priority is to easily share and transfer your files without using so much memory to store large files. Think about your specific needs and goals for digitizing your collection. You might want a combination of these, so determining what your priorities are will help you choose the best method of digitization for you. The quality of your digital image is determined by its resolution, which is based on the number of pixels per inch, also referred to as PPI. And pixels are microscopic electronic particles that together make up your digital image as a whole. So, all of those pixels come together to visually display a photo of your grandpa, for example. The more pixels an image has, the better the quality. If your digital file has low resolution, meaning fewer pixels per inch, then the quality of the photo will be grainier than a higher resolution would yield. So the image won't be as crisp and clear as an image with more pixels would. 
you'll get a much better print from a higher resolution image, but the size of the file will often be significantly larger, which will require more memory for storage and maybe too large to email or upload to a website. The maximum file size accepted for an email is usually between 10 to 25 megabytes, and genealogy sites such as Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org allow you to upload up to 15 megabytes. Which brings us to the file type. Two commonly used formats for images are JPEG and TIFF files. A JPEG has an average size of about 10 megabytes, let's say, while a TIFF file can reach up to four gigabytes. So for example, if you have an external hard drive with one terabyte of storage, that would hold roughly 100,000 JPEGs or 250 TIFFs if the TIFFs were four gigabytes each. That's a very rough estimate, but I use it just to give you an idea of the storage implications for each file type. The TIFF file format is typically used by professionals and recommended for a digital master because it stores a lot more image data than the JPEG. The result is richer, more detailed, and higher quality images overall. TIFFs are typically uncompressed files or use lossless compression, meaning there isn't any data loss but TIFF files are much larger and take up more space. A JPEG is a lossy compressed image file, meaning that the quality of the image has been reduced to achieve a smaller, more manageable file size, making it easier to store, transfer, and upload to various websites. So each has its advantages and disadvantages, and some people will choose to digitize in both formats to get the best of both worlds, but that's a more time-consuming method that requires even more storage. If you do choose to digitize your photos as a JPEG, make sure that the settings are set to a high-quality JPEG with low compression for the best results. You'll also need to decide what equipment you want to use to digitize your photos. Taking pictures of your photos using your phone is probably the easiest method of digitizing, but the end result won't be as high quality as using a scanner. The goal when you're creating a digital master is to capture the image as close to its original form as possible. And when you're taking photos on your phone, the photo could be distorted, there could be a glare if the lighting isn't good, and the resolution won't be ideal, meaning you're going to have a lower quality image than if you had scanned it. If your main goal is to just get your photo collection in a digital format and be done with it, then taking photos on your phone is better than not doing it at all. Luckily, phones today have pretty great cameras on them and you can capture a decent digital image. You could also use a DSLR camera to digitize your photographs if you would prefer that method. If you decide to use a camera or your phone, make sure that the natural lighting is good. Don't use the flash. Use the camera's highest resolution setting and fill your viewfinder to the edges of the photo that you're taking a picture of. If you decide to use a scanning app on your phone, then make sure that the app is using the native resolution and native compression settings of your phone. Otherwise, it could save your photo with its own default settings and you might not be getting the best digital image possible out of it. Personally, I prefer to use my flatbed scanner for the majority of my digitization needs for its maximum image quality. If you have a fragile photograph or one that can't be placed on a flatbed because it's encased or it's stuck to an album, then it's best to use an overhead or even a handheld portable scanner if you have access to one. Your local library can be a great resource for your scanning needs, or again, you could just use your phone if you don't want to go to the trouble of going to the library or buying or renting equipment. If you do choose to use a scanner, you should scan the prints between 600 to 800 ppi, and your slides and negatives should be scanned at 3200 ppi. The PPI you should use will change depending on the size and detail of the photo that you're scanning. So the smaller that a photo is, the higher your PPI should be. The more detailed that your photo is, the higher you're going to want to set your PPI. If you just want to set your PPI at one setting and not have to mess around with it after that, then setting it between 600 to 800 PPI would be best. If you want to take the time to adhere to archival standards, then the rule is that you need 4,000 pixels on the longest side of the photograph. That means if you have an 8x10, you should scan it at 400 ppi because the longest side of the photograph is 10 inches, and 10 inches multiplied by 400 ppi gives you 4,000 pixels on the longest side. 
No matter what PPI settings you choose, you'll need to manually change them in your scanning preferences. Do not use the default settings or the auto scan function. Once you've selected the photos that you'll begin with and you've decided on the settings for the file format and resolution, it's time for the third step, which is to start digitizing. It's easiest to do this if you have a dedicated work area so you can pick right back up where you left it, although not all of us have the space to do that. So wherever you decide to set up, just make sure that your workspace is always clean and you aren't eating or drinking around your photographs and equipment. And be mindful of the natural light in the space that you choose if you are using a phone or a camera. Once you've digitized your photo, be sure to add the metadata. Metadata is essentially data about data. In this case, it's basically the digital way to write on your photo and have that information travel wherever your digital file travels. You can add the date and location that the photo was taken, the names of the people in the photo. If the photo was an original of yours or a copy that someone gave you, you can add keywords and tags so that you can more easily find people, locations, or subjects, for example. My next video will walk you through what a typical flatbed scanning session looks like for me and what my process and workflow is for that. So if that's a method that you're thinking about going for and you're interested to learn more, I'll be posting that video on Wednesday and I'll be showing you how I add metadata to my photos. If you're wondering, by the way, adding metadata to your photos will not degrade your digital master. The fourth step after digitizing is to properly store and back up your digital files, which I covered in more detail in my video, Three Steps to Organize and Preserve Your Family History Items. If you've watched that, you'll know that I'm a fan of the 321 method as an archivist. So three copies, two types of media, and one off-site to back up your digital masters. I also talked more about organizing your digital artifacts in that particular video, so if you're still not sure how you'd like to do that, you can check out that video for some ideas. But at this stage, you're going to want to have an established method for how you plan to keep your family history artifacts organized in a way that suits your needs and goals and is easy for you to access and navigate. Finally, the fifth step is to share your hard work. Share the images with your family members, share them on your favorite genealogy sites. The more that you share and spread out copies of your photos, the less likely they're to be lost forever. You could make someone very happy by sharing your precious family photos. It's possible that they've never seen a photo of their grandparents or great grandparents or great great grandparents. There's no sense in gatekeeping photos when you could bring so much joy to someone else and even help them solve a family mystery or break down a brick wall. You never know what connections or friendships could come out of it. The genealogy community is such a friendly, generous, and connected community. The more we help each other out and share, the better we'll all be for it. So that's all for today, folks. I'll be going over how to upload your photos to various genealogy sites in the upcoming videos as well. So stay tuned if that's something that you'd like to do.